welcome to the channel welcome scott the freezer frost one pocket hall of famer frosty welcome can i call you frosty yeah it's a miss that's a misprint but the hall of fame part but yeah thank yeah, you you're a one pocket hall of famer right scott very interested to see your equipment i've had a sneaky look at your queue it is a very special queue we'll get to that in a minute if you wouldn't mind just empty out the pockets let's see what gadgets a one pocket legend carries around the world with the film. sponsor patches shout out pool action tv ray hansen probably the best streamer the best streamer in the united states okay nick's edge gotta have some nick's edge i used to have one of them very clever man this thing tool. yeah this thing's like a decade and a half old and i still use it for your shaft right? yeah, yeah it's actually a great product yeah, and you're you can, welcome nick you can wash them is that right? Yeah, you can. I never do, you but but you can. Right. Um, and then fine grit. I don't know what this is. Two thousand. Two thousand. This is for the tip. I, I mean, this is. I guess it's a shout out series as well. Shout out to Dennis Searing. In my opinion, the best tips in the world. I struggled for years finding the right tip. I'm not going to mention any other tips, but but by far the best tip that I've experimented with. Scott, I didn't know he made tips. Yeah, the I dude's knew he unbelievable. Was a phenomenal cue maker. Bro, this guy is. We had a six-hour phone conversation about leather, because I'm I'm a I'm a little bit something's Obsession. wrong with me, right? Obsession. Yeah, and uh, I would say you have to be to be a one. The guy player. understood everything that I was saying, and I've never spoke to anybody like that before. And he knew more. Not that I know anything about leather, but I know what leather does with cues, and it was mind-boggling how he test tips. He does it by sound. Everybody uses those chrometers or diameters, whatever it is. They all use those. Those actually don't work. They only run to like just a, f a fraction into the tip. He has a room for sound to what? test the density of the leather, Eesh. which is unbelievable. But yeah. this guy, and I didn't even know that he made cues until like three weeks ago. Um, sure. And we've become good friends, pretty good friends. I only know because when I first started playing, I went to the BCA and he had a, a vendor stall thing there. Yeah. He had about four cues. And some somebody had said, oh, this guy's the best or one of the best cue makers in America. And then I got chatting to him like you and he was saying like, as you tighten the cue, you do this little thing and everything was like handmade and perfect. I thought, this guy's like, oh, Dude, he's an absolute perfectionist. There's yeah. got to be something wrong with him. Right, because anybody that's that good at something, there's got to be something wrong with you, right? Just like pool players, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I'm serious. The, the searing tip, and you can go online. Um, you can go online. What's it called? Uh, precision. Precision tips. Uh, so pre precision.com. Uh, the best tip I've ever, ever seen. I, I've had one on, and it's lasted me a year, but he picks these tips out. He picks two or three out of, like, 3,000 tips. Wow. Specifically for what I exactly want. He knows exactly what I want, and he can do that for other top players. It's amazing. Wow, what a guy. Um, Very interesting. Then the Master's Chalk, but that's specifically for this event in this, okay, in this cloth, which... That color. Which I think is the, the blue, but not that. Which I think is the best cloth in the industry now. Shout out Ivan Lee. And Aramis, one of my very good friends. Why do you think it's the best? The cloth? Yes. By the way it's made, it's, it, I'll tell you, I know a little bit of the history. This, this company was not Tweedin' before, it was a different company. It's, it's pre-1800s, this cloth. Tweedin' is something that's been, it's been designed. As a matter of fact, you or me, if you worked for the company, yeah. nine times out of ten, you'll never get to go to the factory and see where this is made because there's a certain way they do it that they've kept secret for over a century. Honestly? That's 100% the truth. Wow, that's incredible. 100% truth, and it's the same way with Aramith. There's, a, there's an issue with, or there's a deal with Aramith where the way these balls are made, there's a, there's a compound and a recipe and a way that they do it, and nobody's been able to match the product. So it's like a like an old family it's recipe. Like, it's like exactly what it is, it. and I, I I take I could be wrong with the cloth, but I'm a hundred percent with the balls. But I mean, anybody that's tried to come out with a new cloth or a better cloth, I'm just being honest. The players will give the feedback, and that's what people do or don't like about me. But it doesn't match what this what this cloth does. And also, 
and you've played on many different colours just like I have. I have. It, just the grey itself just looks clean, doesn't it? It looks, looks clear. I think it's the new thing. We had this colour cloth during bonus ball. I don't know if you remember bonus ball. Vegas. Vegas. I never played it, but I remember you playing it. Yeah, and a bunch yeah, of other guys. Raj and a bunch of Europeans yeah, played it. Thorsten, um, Jeremy. And they had this color cloth, and we all immediately liked it right. because it, it brightened everything up. The blue looks great, right? It looks great, but it's darker, especially when you get my age, 70. When you get in your age, it's like 60, 70. When you're, yeah. But, yeah, it's, it, I love this color. The other color cloth that I always preferred, was, I always hated tournament blue, was the powder blue. But I suppose powder blue, you sort of go into this color, are you? I agree. Right, okay, what else we got? I don't really use this anymore. That's the Q-Tech bow tie. I know that because Jennifer Beretta had one. Well, shout out Q-Tech. I'm trying to get a jump or a break cue through them. Um, but yeah, so I don't really use that. I carry this with me just in case something happens. Wow, so you put you actually put them on the table. Yeah, if, if I'm gambling, which I really don't do anymore. Why um, would you put that on the table? I'd be one of them that peels it off the table. Why would you put that on the table? What because sometimes, sometimes in a money match, let's say the spot's bad, and your opponent, if I want to take it off, my opponent will want it on, right? So there'll be a discrepancy, and I'll say, okay, if you want one on, then here we go, right. and I'll just put it on. So you always want to just have have it there, just in case. Up an edge. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It might have, might be might go against me. Um, and then my jump cues and break cues. Yeah, just whack them on the table. So the Predator can, Air. That's the old one. Yeah, the old one. More junk. But this is what I really like, and this is old school. I don't even know if they make these anymore. Um, but this is what I use to slightly roughen up my tip or, or get the glaze off of it, um, which is nice. I've got a question about the jump cue because my knowledge on one pocket <coughs> is not great. Can you play jump shots in one pocket? Actually, the first time Efren and I played even for 5,000, I was up. What we were racing to eight. I was up, no, I think it was like five to five, or I was up six to five, race to eight, and I had a shot. And the only way I could get out of the trap was with a jump cue that nobody had ever said you couldn't jump before. So I just pulled it out, and he said you couldn't jump, and everybody else said you could, and we really didn't know. Oh, really? So I went ahead and did it, right? And it turned out, I think I actually slapped a ball in my pocket off of his break or something with the jump cue, and it's on film. Um, and now it's against the rules. I think that's kind of crazy, personally, because you can jump playing nine ball you want. Wouldn't it be tougher to jump playing one pocket? I'm going to let my guy jump anytime he wants playing one pocket. So why should it be illegal when it's legal 600 times a game playing rotation pool? That's interesting. That's but opinion. that's my opinion. Okay. I also have, since this extension is out, but yep. this is, I just had this made, and it comes in handy. This is probably one of the longest extensions in the world, and I'm I'm six three, um, but it really comes up. It comes up all the time, and I I am so thankful I had it made. Are, are we saying it comes up all the time in one pocket or in nine balls? I think in, I think in both games. I've used it like five or six times in this tournament. Oh, okay. Where where I'm terrible with a bridge. I know your background. You, English player and all that, so you're probably much better than I am with the bridge. I'm terrible. I can barely even hold the bridge, let alone use it. So, so you've I, had this specially made? Yeah, I have. Um, Might come in handy if someone's arguing with you all over money and you a bit. Yeah, that too. <laughs> That's the only reason why. <laughs> yeah, but I just take off running <laughs> at, okay. at this what point. Else we got? Got a little shout out Acme cases, right? I, I, this is Omega Acme case. Acme, did you say? A C M E Acme. Acme yeah. Cases. And and it's a a lot of the players have this case. It's very lightweight and very durable. This case I've had for like three years now, and you, it looks like practically looks like it's brand new. And I beat my 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 equipment up. Uh, this is a cool little pouch, more chalk for the U.S. Open. And then the thing, this, is, this is this is like a secret pouch as well. Oh, right. So it's got my joint protectors for my main playing cue up here and a couple other joint protectors that I never put on. Yep. And then uh, my cues. Right, break cue first. Let's save the special playing cue till the end. Oh, the blue PK Rush. Is this a new color that they've brought out? Oh, I don't know. I've had it for a while. Oh, okay. I've had um, it like a year. Right, so he's got the BK Rush 
Are you sponsored off Predator or is it just? No. No, you just. No, but I've always used the Predator brake cues, but I think, I think I want to switch to to QTech, to be honest. Yeah, that's a nice brake cue. I've had a few shots. With I've them. heard a lot of good things about it. Nothing against Predator, but I've heard a lot of great things about the QTech and their playing cues. Actually, I'm just not a low deflection guy. Right, we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's the brake cue. Are we on the cue then? It's up to you. I think that's all I've got left. Do you have one, two shafts, one shaft? Two, right, but I only get, use one. Let's get the shafts out. We've got let's do it, pal. Of the book last. That's the shaft I don't use, ever. Right. So that's the spare shaft. Now, this shaft, the cue maker, is that his shaft? That is. Right, so that's just, what is it, just a maple shaft? What's the? Just a clean maple shaft. Really no knots or flaws in the, in the wood. They pick out the best they can for me, but yeah. My problem is I'm really, really um, mental when it comes to this. Like, I won't sh ever switch shafts with, with a cue, and you'll notice this shaft is whittled down, and I don't really ever sand it either. Right, but let's have a look at your, the, your plane shaft. The yeah, and shaft it's probably shaft. filthy, too. Well, you know... Oh, no, it's not bad. I cleaned it the oh other no, day. That's not bad, yeah. So, you know how, for instance, if you had a Revo shaft, you could literally just throw one in the bin and get another one? Would you struggle swapping shafts because it's a yeah, its own piece of metal? Yeah, I, I'm a, I'll, I might need to go to the hospital or go to a rubber room. Yes, I, so I, a I've got like a serious issue with it. So it's a bit like snooker. A snooker player can't just lose his cue and then... Oh, dude, it's time. like playing with a whole new world. And, wow, and okay, man, it's, it's very hard for me to do. That's why I've, I've never sold my cues like a lot of guys. and I've always kept the same cue sponsor, or I've tried. I, I started out with a Cognoscente. And then, oddly enough, that cue got stolen. Joey Gold out of Chicago, that cue got stolen. Joey wouldn't do anything with me as far as sponsoring me a new cue. Um, I guess he just doesn't do that. So I had this cue specced after that Joey Gold that I played with for 15 years. Right, okay, well. So then that's what this is kind of specced off of. Diameter of the tip, where you at with that? I like it flatter or less round. No, the thickness of the tip. Well, it's no, a little no, lower no. than I typically like it. It's about due, but I've had it for a long time. Yeah, is that because of the one pocket or like, like if you play one pocket and then you're going to play nine ball, are you just using the same tip? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. My cue is built for one pocket. Oh, and I didn't bring it. So I had an extension made about that long, four inch extension with, it's only an ounce in weight. Right. It's hollowed out. And I put it on, I just started playing with it two weeks ago, and I put it on the back of my cue to play rotation. Because my cue's kind of designed for one pocket. It's 18 ounces and not low deflection. And what that's for, and Paggy Lion and some of the other elite one pocket players will probably tell you the same thing, is it's for tight areas. I can twist and turn the ball. I can nip and tuck it like mass A's in little areas, just slight mass A's. Whereas if you use a low deflection shaft, that becomes really tough in tight areas. So for people who are watching who don't really understand that, are we saying low deflection is stiffer? That's got a bit of bend? It does. Yeah, this right. is going to swerve more. Yeah. You're going to have to uh, a lot for the swerve a little bit more. But you can do more with it in smaller, in tight areas. Whereas low deflection, the cue ball is going to go more straight. Right. So for me, because I'm old school, and for most of the one pocket players that I know, um, the, the maple shaft is the way to go because you can do a lot of, I guess I'm gonna use the word kinky. You can do a lot of kinky things in tight areas. Why well, I heard you was into some kinky shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> listen, if you was gonna play a full year nine ball, would you get rid of that shaft and use something else or would if, you stick with that? <clears throat> that's a good question. I've struggled with it. I've had many low deflection shafts sent to me and they're all sitting in my bedroom. Um, that's a great question. If I were to only play nine ball for a full year, I would possibly go, go to a Q-Tech low deflection. Possibly. Because, because that also looks quite thin. What is the diameter it is. at that's, the end? Uh, probably 12 or a little bit under, probably under 12 now. This is like 12 and, and eight. And this is probably a little under it because it's just whittled down. And the Q length, it's just a standard length? Q. Yeah, yeah. And these are ivory ferrules also, yes. which is a softer hit. Right. And 
one pocket plays they would never use an extension would they always have some no small I, one? I always love playing a guy like shane that would have an extension on because i think you get more power right so you, you go through the ball yeah. more but i mean those guys play so good that i was thinking wrong um but yeah i mean for me because i've been playing the game since i was young 18 19 years old for me I can do a lot more with a lighter cue that's got more more whip to it in tight areas. Right, that's amazing. Right, let's yeah. get to the book because we've seen the shafts. Okay. I have seen this book. This is something special. First of all, what is the cue brand? Who is the maker of this cue? Shout out to my buddy and like he's like family to me now, Ken Thyman. Ken, um, Ken Thyman, Thyman out of Ken. St. Louis or suburb of St. Okay. Louis. Does he have a web page? Or? KT Customs. Right, I'm going to put that in the description because this queue is a phenomenal piece of work. So you can check out the website and see what. Yeah, so about. he only probably makes about 10 or 12 queues a year. And they surprised me with this queue. Oh boy, I don't even know now. At least eight years ago. Um, I just want to look at the, um, the thread, the joint. It's black. What exactly is that? Correct. So this is this is G10, which is a material that they build aircraft out of in certain parts of aircraft. It's a very lightweight but very hard material. Um, that they test this material by slamming it on concrete. And I'm not going to do that here, but it's 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 the same pin wow. that was in the Cognoscente, right? Joey Gold and Cognoscente is probably one of the best American cues ever built. Um, so, like I said, I had it spec'd after that. I think he uses them in a lot of his cues now. Um, it's a radial pin, but it's a G10. I, I, plastic's not even the word. It's a it's a high end, high high end material. So you're using a radial because it goes into the wood. Better. Yeah, and I think you got a better connection there. So it feels more like one piece. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. Okay. Which is so when that happens, in my my opinion, with high end cues, the more inlays and things you have the more room for error in the hit of the cue. But that is not the case with this cue. I'm just absolutely amazed. And, you know, a lot of a lot of the guys, John Mora and uh, Chris Reinhold, and a lot of these guys have hit balls with this cue. I think Shaw's hit balls with this cue. They all love it. It's yeah, I can imagine. just I mean, a pure it, hit, man. It looks insane. Now, I can see a lot of silver on the cue. What is exactly that? What's the material? That is silver. It's pure yeah, silver? It's silver. Wow, pure silver, yeah. Amazing. And they do amazing, well, he does amazing silver work. Absolutely amazing. And um, white, I'm guessing, is ivory? It is all ivory. Right. And then a, a lady, a famous lady by the name of Crystal Herbert, and, and the Q collectors in this industry will know who that is, world-renowned Scrimshaw artist. She, Scrimshaw is like tattooing. You use a tool. It's a, a, a type of uh, a type of metal tool, okay. and you hand etch into the ivory um, the lettering. And from what I understand, it took a couple years to do the um, the lettering. Well, it took a couple years for me to get the cue, so realistically, I don't really know, but it, I know it took a year for her to, to hand scrimshaw these letters into here. So the cue maker makes the cue, sends it off. Correct. And she scrimshaw tattoos it for however long it takes. That's correct, and, and cue makers like Andy Gilbert, um, which is a high-end, world-renowned cue maker in America now, or in the world, he's used her and, and some, other, some other top elite yeah, cue right. makers as well. On the butt end of the queue, I can see like a silver ring. Is that silver, pure silver as well? Yeah, that was added later. <laughs> Why? What's the reason for that? Because I have a bad habit of like just, and even not even out of anger, I just always have a bad habit of just letting my queue kind of drop. Okay. And this is an ivory butt plate, and I broke it like three times, right? It's quite soft. Very soft. It's, it, it'll chip. It's brittle. I, ivory's always brittle. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, it would chip, and finally I sent it to him, and he sent it back. I didn't even know he did it, but he put this stainless uh, sleeve on it to keep me from costing him more money every time I sent it back. <laughs> right. Obviously, we've talked about the scrimshaw. We need to know what it says. Can you read out each different one? Tell us what it says. Yeah. Come on. I mean, now because that is pretty special. Th though. Th this cue has a lot to do with the history of my play, so it, it, it's a title cue, or that's what the title or the name of this cue is. <clears throat> so, in 2005, I won the Louis Roberts Award, which was like I guess the Gambler of the Year, 
at the Derby City. At, at the Derby City, yes. and you, you get at the time when I won it, I was gambling so much, and just kind of my life was wild that it didn't really do much uh, mentally. I, I didn't think it was really that big a deal. They told me, they told me they that I won an award, and the next thing you know, like two or three weeks later, I realized how valuable that award was. It's in 2005, so what, that's been 18 years. Yeah. If you add up, uh, has that been 18 years? Is my math right? 2005, yeah. Okay. If you add up free hotel room and entry fees for life in that Gosh, tournament. You get that for life. For life. Wow. For winning that award. Awesome. Shout out Greg Sullivan and Diamond Billiard Products and the Derby City Classic, the best American tournament to ever live with an all-around event. Yeah. I think this is the best I've ever seen, but this U.S. Open. But anyway, yeah, so I won that award, and then I won the Music City Open, which was an old-school, brutal bar table tournament. Um, ended up beating Nick Varner in the finals. This was way back. I think this was in like 2002. Nick Varner had me, Nick Varner had me 11 to one, and I beat him 13 to 11 in the finals. I put like a nine on him, and then oh, played wow. safe and like run the set out. Uh, this this is debatable, but this was among some of my peers. But I was voted the 21st century biggest cash player, and back then I firmly believe I was. But uh, so they put that in there in the Carolina Open, which was another rotation tournament that, that I won. Uh, now back then, I was seven-time Arizona State champion and U.S. Bar Table champion. Okay. Um, now I've got like 18 Arizona State champion titles. He's got to go back. And no. <laughs> can't happen um, and on the butt and on the butt yeah. uh, somebody just won a match in the Derby City one pocket I won that in uh, 2009 I made the finals man and I th that was my dream to win that tournament if I, I felt like if I won the Derby City one pocket I could just go home and never play again um, and when 2009 came around I was gutted John Schmidt beat me in the finals in like 30 seconds it seemed like and I thought I'd just never get a chance to get back in it because you've got to win like 17, 18 rounds and a race to three to get there. And the next year I made the finals again and I won. So that's probably my my biggest, you know, feather in the cap. Yep. Legends in one pocket was a major. Grady Matthews had, Efren and all, all of them were in it. And then the U.S. Open one pocket. Those are probably th my three biggest one pocket titles. Uh, I've won some majors outside of that. Like last year, I won the U.S. Open Banks and beat Carlo Beato in the finals. But yeah, I mean that's that's about it, pal. Yeah, but that that is a work of art. That is a beautiful. It is, um, Scott. Listen, I've really enjoyed this. It's been a big insight. I've got two questions to ask you. Can't wait. I can see a flash watch on your wrist. <laughs> <laughs> this cue, this cue is all about one pocket. It says Gambler of the Year. What's the biggest? cash game you've played at one pocket yeah i still haven't seen it I, and i have witnesses that were with me we they helped me put the money up i beat a guy out of around 1.2 million in vegas what? and we played insane. one set for 360,000 a piece so we had to we had to put the money up right <clears throat> and people got word we were gambling real high at this pool room in las vegas and it was uh what was it called? Oh my gosh! It's, it's now Griff's. Yeah, the old. Uh, it was called. Uh, Pool sharks. Pool sharks. Yeah. Pool the sharks, pit. and it had the table. pit. Yeah, 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 yeah. We started out betting fifty thousand. We ended up betting three hundred and sixty thousand a set. Um, but it got, people got word that we we're betting that kind of money, and we were just posting up in there, right? He was bringing him chips, and we had cash. But then we started using his chips because we were using his own money. Um, but so this this set he wanted to play was for like three. It was three hundred and sixty thousand a piece. So we met at the, he was a professional poker player, and we met at the Aria, and went back into like the Phil Ivey's room, yeah. Phil Ivey's poker room yeah. at the Aria, and they had a lockbox back there in this weird room, like this dark weird room, and there was one guy in there with a gun, and like he was like the security guy, and just sitting in there like what are we what are we doing and all of a sudden the guy I'm playing walks in with this duffel bag right and the duffel bag was full of, not joking it was full of fives tens twenties and fifties he was pretty upset he was stuck I had him stuck pretty bad I'm stuck like seven hundred thousand at the time so he brings like it took us six and a half hours or something like that to count the money that is unbelievable. yeah so it took us that long to count the money so so and that was real cash like so, uh, playing ten ahead 
And I beat him in that week. I beat him 10, 10 ahead sets, giving him 18 to four. So he had to make four balls to your 18. Yeah, and he busted everybody else getting that game. He busted, nobody else beat him at that game. Can we name him? You don't have to. Yeah, it, was, he, he, it, it became a big story because some crazy stuff happened as okay. well. It was the only lawsuit that probably Pools ever had for gambling in Las Vegas. Um, and we ended up settling out, but his name was Viffer. Oh, Poker after dark. Mean. Yeah, he had the yeah. tattoo. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a, he was a freaking. This guy was a green light man. He was a gambler, you know. Yes. So he was a gambler, and I have much respect to him. Uh, he had no quit in him, um, and he just fired. He just kept firing at me, and I played the best pool. I'll never play like this again. I don't know what happened to me. I wasn't supposed to win, and I just kept winning. What's it like playing a game like that? Because it's obviously different from a tournament. Is it is it like nervous? Is it like pumped up energy? It, what does it feel like? It was like the that? best rush of my life. Probably like you could, I don't know. I don't know. It was, it was the best rush of my life. Um, but it also ruined me in a lot of ways for a long time. Because after that, you was rich. Well, I wasn't rich, but I was so used to betting so high that yeah. when, it, when the three and $5,000 sets came around, I had zero motivation, That's not because I had money, but it was because I couldn't get that, that, that lift that I needed, that rush that I needed to play that type of set, right. when in all reality, I should be playing those sets any chance I get. Yeah. So there was like a two or three or four year period where I just was like struggling mentally with, with playing for big money, you know. And when you're 75 and you sat in your rocking chair, you must look back on that and think, that was some crazy oh, shit. Oh, dude, I, <laughs> yeah, I look back at it all the time. I mean, there's been several guys I beat for well over 100,000, several in my career, um, but that was that was just unbelievable. The first set we played for 50,000, Billy and Cardona, and me, and, and we had a game plan. We were putting up 50,000, and if he beats us, we're done. But we knew we were getting a big price on the money, right? Okay. We. I beat him 10 ahead in like 45 minutes. I'm not exaggerating. There was like hundreds of people there. And he flips the coin and says, bet 100. And I didn't even look at my team. I said, bet. I literally beat him in like an hour and 15 minutes playing 10 ahead, giving this guy 18 to four. So before I can blink an eye, I'm up 150,000. Wow. We played one more set for 100 that night. And in like two and a half, three hours, I was up 250,000. I thought we were done. I go to the... I go to the restaurant, we, we're like celebrating, and during that time, I get a text message and he says, meet me tomorrow at three, we're betting 150,000. So it just took off from there, it was insane. Wow, that is crazy, that is crazy stuff. Yeah, man, crazy, really crazy. Last question, is there a shot at one pocket that comes up a lot, which you just love to play? Is there a, is there a standard shot where you think, this is like a true one pocket shot? Does that exist? Yeah, I mean, it's a defensive shot for me. It's a kick and stick. Like, I, I really like digging balls out of, out of the pocket. I think Jeremy's credited me to being probably the best in the world at that, or one of. If the ball's deep in my opponent's pocket, I can kick and stick and, like, hold the cue ball deep in the jaws to where it makes them tough for them. So I just reverse the game on them in a lot of different ways. Can you show us? Oh, where's the ball? Come. Let's go, pal. So I'll play it to open up balls on my side as well. Just like oh, that. Oh, yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Because that looked quite close to the rail. It's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, I left it. That was pretty easy. But it was just a quick example of, of probably one of my go-to shots, which is something that everybody in one pocket needs to really practice is digging balls out and kicking and sticking. I think, I think that's a huge part of the game that's overlooked. Scott, that was awesome. Really enjoyed it. Very insightful. Always Thank you, pal. Cheers, buddy. All right.